Ms. Green is the first African American and the third woman to serve as the state's ambassador for poetry and the spoken word. A native of Orange County, Jackie has been active in North Carolina's literary and teaching community for more than 40 years. She has penned eight books of poetry, co-edited two poetry anthologies, and written one play. She is a 2014 North Carolina Literary Hall of Fame inductee and was the recipient of the North Carolina Award for Literature in 2003. During the, the announcement for uh, her being named as the Poet Laureate, Susie Hamilton, who is Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources said, Jackie is an award-winning poet with a strong commitment to use poetry as a platform for building bridges across race, religion, age, gender, and identity. What a welcome addition she is to the tradition of poet laureates in North Carolina. Jackie currently teaches documentary poetry at Duke University Center for Documentary Studies. Over the last 40 years, she has taught poetry and facilitated creative writing classes at public libraries, universities, and community colleges, public and private schools, and with literary organizations across the United States. As a community arts advocate, Jackie Green has created and facilitated programs that serve various audiences and populations, including the incarcerated, homeless, chronically and mentally ill, victims of domestic violence, public and private schools, literacy programs, immigrants, and community economic development and social justice nonprofits. She was named inaugural North Carolina Piedmont Laureate in 2009 and won the Sam Reagan Award for Contributions to the Fine Arts of North Carolina in 2007. These are just a few of the accolades. I don't have time for all of them. Jackie Shelton Green's poetry, I'll leave you with this last interesting fact. Her poetry has been widely choreographed by dance companies, a number of dance companies. And with that, please join me in welcoming Miss Jackie Shelton Green. Wow. So I thought that this was when we all did siesta. <laughs> yeah. Y'all know about food and sleep. I am so grateful, so humbled, and very honored to have been invited by the Siler City Literacy Council. I'm grateful for their invitation to participate in their annual Fall for Literacy Luncheon. This is truly a magnificent space, and I am reminded of all the work I've done with literacy groups, not just in the United States, but across the world. In the spirit of who I am, and in the spirit of from whence I enter as a writer who believes in and knows the power of story, I'm going to tell you a story. And the story that I'm going to tell you, I think you will make the connectedness, the connections, the connectivity, of literacy, the power of literacy to this story. A story that carries me, a story that keeps me, a story that instructs and directs me in my humanity and in my creativity. My grandmother would tell me this story practically every day. 
So you know those stories that old people tell you and you're like, mm -hmm, I've heard this a thousand times. The story is that my grandmother's grandmother was the property, but also the daughter of the white plantation owner who owned her family. My grandmother's grandmother was specifically the property of her three-year-old half-sister. My grandmother's grandmother lived in the house, the big house, the plantation house, the plantation mansion, as it was called, with her father, her white father's family, her half-siblings. The wife of my grandmother's grandmother's mother did not like this child for obvious reasons. And it was her wish for many, many years to rid herself of this child, to sell her. But the father would not, did not sell her. The story is that one day my grandmother's grandmother was sitting in a room with the white mother and her children. This white mother was adamant about literacy, about education for her white children. The white half-siblings had secretly taught my grandmother's grandmother how to read and write. It was the children's secret. On this particular day, my grandmother's grandmother was in the room, perhaps performing some task like tending to the food that was inside the hearth, or maybe she was sewing, but she was there, she was present. As a woman was teaching her children a lesson, her white children had forgotten the answer. And they all looked at my grandmother's grandmother, who was the oldest. They knew she knew the answer. And because she was only nine years old, she blurted the answer out. She did not understand the consequence of what it means to be unlawful as a slave child to know how to read and write. On that day, it was discovered that my grandmother's grandmother could read and write. On that day, my grandmother's grandmother was thrown out of the house, was sent away from her mother, who also lived in the house, to go live at the edge of the plantation with an old slave woman who had outlived her service. A few months later, the white woman would have her wish granted. My grandmother's grandmother was sold. The day that the plantation owner came from a few counties away to take this child away, my grandmother's grandmother's mother was running behind an old buck wagon, an old wooden wagon, screaming and crying that her child not be taken from her. In the dust, as she's running, a rusty nail fell from that buck wagon. My grandmother's grandmother picked up a rusty nail, that rusty nail, the rusty nails that you can touch that sit at your table. My grandmother's grandmother's mother picked up that nail. She tied it at the hem of her apron, and she kept it. What we keep keeps us. She kept it. That nail, which is not here, because it's in a sacred place. I have that nail. That nail has been passed down on the matrilineal side of my mother's family. I've had that nail since I was 25 years old, and now I'm 66. With that nail comes responsibility, accountability. So I tell the story one, because my grandmother said, you have to know this story. Your job is to tell. Your job is to write. So as a child growing up, I never wanted to be a writer. There are days now I don't like being a writer. I never wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be an oceanographer until my family reminded me that I had never seen the ocean, didn't know where the ocean lived, but I still wanted to be an oceanographer. But that nail, 
As my grandmother said, someone who looked just like you almost lost her life just to be able to read and write. So in my family, as a child, the question was never, do you think you want to go to college? The question was always, where do you think you might want to go to college? And we should start looking at colleges in the sixth grade. This preparation of a life of being literate comes from that nail. So I keep that nail because that nail instructs my life. It has instructed my life as a writer, the power of story. Years later, my grandmother's, grandmother's mother would buy her child out of slavery. She made enough money to buy her child back. That is why I have the nail. The American novelist Joan Didion once wrote, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. In many ways, Didion was right. Stories may not seem like a basic survival need, but our brains naturally tell stories as a way to give structure and meaning to our lives. According to research in narrative psychology, which is an emerging field of study that examines how stories shape our lives and personalities. The stories we tell ourselves play a large role in who we are. Neuroscientist Antonio Damasio explains that consciousness begins when brain gains the power, the simple power, I might add, of telling a story. My grandmother's grandmother's story has served me well as that one important story that I retell myself about myself, my life story. And the story of that story has helped me to organize my experiences, given me a deeper sense of self, and in some cases, shapes my behavior. I know that the stories we tell ourselves about our lives don't just shape our personalities, they are our personalities. But I have questions for you this morning. What is your story? What is your relationship with all of your constant evolving stories? How do you measure your joys, successes, sorrows, regrets, achievements, disappointments? How do you hold, fold, carry, or perhaps bury your story? Where do you keep your story? If you remember to remember your stories, then you will learn that what we keep truly does keep us. You will further understand how our stories organically guide, instruct, inform, and often protect us. How are you imagining your story as you revisit past life circumstances? How can you envision the future as little stories that haven't happened yet? How does your story help you to perceive and manifest, to become highly generative? And by generative, I mean caring, productive, and committed to making a positive difference in the world. In this room, there are highly generative people who at some time have been fired, experienced a major health challenge, survived a complicated divorce, perhaps an, un, perhaps an interrupted education, or was or is an exhausted caregiver. But we lift up these disruptions, these sorrows and losses. We, trans we transition them into positive outcomes. We are generative people using our stories as a catalyst for a better opportunity to arise later down the road. The basic arc of a generative story or your life script is always going through the storm, the eye of the needle, and coming out of it better than we were ever before. 
Even though our stories are determined largely by our cultures and personalities, we have a degree of control over what we tell ourselves about our own lives. Consciously think about or imagine yourselves as human museums. Human museums with many rooms, which are really your story rooms. Only you should be the ones constructing these rooms. Only you have a conscious sense or a conscious awareness of your personal power that is lodged deep in the DNA of your stories. Only you should be the curator of your human museum. And only you should own the keys to your human museum. I tell my students that I teach at Duke over and over again to be, to be very careful of the lens that we use to tell or control someone else's story. How many of us have walked into a room and stories are made up about us that are totally false? Yeah, it happens to a lot of us all the time. Totally false. No thread or truth whatsoever. You walk in, people look at what you look like, and they make up their own narrative about you. And then, even when you tell them your truth, folks still don't hold on to their truth about you that is not true. Be careful. No thread of truth. In our immediate present lives in this American culture, we witness how judgment, stereotypes, and fake information has literally destroyed lives. Be very, very careful with your power and the powerful truths of your story. Never allow anyone to mute, erase, or malign your story. We must celebrate our stories as a long-term gain and how we are leaving the world a better place through the future stories we have yet to conceive. We celebrate our stories from a perspective of legacy, telling them really for future generations. Many of us fly on the wings of our celebrated ancestor stories, like my grandmother's grandmother's story. We celebrate our stories as the compasses that they are to help us transform ourselves, to guide us to learn about our history and tell our experiences in order to transcend and act beyond our stories, to live more of our potential. Chatham County communities have many stories to tell and to celebrate. I celebrate the power of the story of a simple rusty nail that speaks to me through generations of grace, strength, and faith. Perhaps there is one powerful story that defines you and your life. How do you celebrate your one powerful story? I encourage you to write it. Take time to describe it vividly with all of its sensations and all of those feelings. Recall and express your joy for telling this story, for keeping it alive in your mind and in your heart. Let the story sit for a few days. Go back, reread it, add more if there's more to write, and then write about your experience of writing the story. Read it again after some time has passed. Be aware of how releasing the story has freed you to examine the lessons or the gifts embedded in your sharing of the story. Use the story and what you have learned to write a legacy letter to someone you care about, someone who may enjoy and benefit from your story in the future. It might be those great grandchildren. It might be that new neighbor immigrant. I was recently invited to write a letter to my 14-year-old self, a letter that would be amongst 365 letters 
gathered from other women who also wrote letters to their 14-year-old selves. These letters were presented as a birthday gift, celebrating the 14th birthday of a dear young friend that I mentor. The stories that I remember to remember in my letter to my 14-year-old Seth were deep celebrations of surviving shyness, nerdiness, awkwardness, and being victimized by many bullies during my childhood. The writing of this letter to myself was so redemptive and celebrated all that I needed to push through as a girl and subsequently as a woman. The letter carried stories that made something else out of me in the process. We are the authors of our own lives. I encourage you to carry your history, your herstory, your story with you, so that you will never forget who you are when your authorship is being compromised, usurped, ignored, erased, disrespected, silenced, held hostage, disenfranchised, devalued, misappropriated, or even rewritten. Commemorate, honor, preserve and protect your story. Remember to remember the stories that are carrying you from one exam to the next, from one fellowship or internship to the next, from one interview to the next interview, from one boardroom to the next, from one hard decision to the next hard decision. Remember to remember the stories that are whispering to you. You know who you are. You got this. I celebrate our collective stories knowing that story is one of the greatest known bridges from our head to our heart. I invite you to allow your stories to churn the soil and run like a river. The flow of your story has the potential to allow people around you to draw whatever they might need in order to take the next step in your journey. And as literacy tutors, we know about that flow of helping people to take that next step. The powerful community leader or corporate leader, the creative and innovative teacher, and the successful entrepreneur all understand that power is locked inside story that is life-giving, fertile, shared, gracious, respectful, a grateful, indiscriminate, and generous story. There are hundreds of books written about the power of storytelling, hundreds of books on how to unleash the power of storytelling, how to win hearts, change minds, and get results in our corporate communities. That last Burger King ad you just saw, and you like hopped in the car and went over. <laughs> but we must also be available to the power of vulnerability, the power of full engagement, the power of transparency as leaders, seeking to energize greater performance. How does the vulnerability of your story lead your tribe? How does the emotional intelligence inside of your story guide you to build resilient teams in these turbulent times? What are the crucial stories inside the crucial conversations that we need now? And crucially, how do we continue to celebrate when things are falling apart all around us. I believe that we continue to celebrate in the telling, the shaping, the packaging, the deliver delivery, and more importantly, we continue to celebrate by validating the worthiness of our stories and our unique voices. In the late 1700s, Enslaved Haitian women were considered more unruly and more unmanageable than their male counterparts. So they were punished harsher and more frequently. 
They use their only single powerful weapon of defense. They used their tongues, their voices. Over and over again, they would not shut up. They would not shut up. You can put us in cages, but we will not shut up. They screamed their stories beyond their chains, right into unnamed skies and unnamed oceans that were holding their herstories. Every breath was a breath of resistance. Over and over again, they screamed, I am here. I celebrate that power of utterance, the smallest unit of speech. I am here. I am here. I am here is a continuous unit of speech, beginning and ending with a clear pause, a clear declaration of power. Right where you are seated, I invite you to repeat these words out loud. I am here. 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 Do you feel the power that lives inside your own breath? The power of utterance. What it means to not be quiet. Today we gather celebrating our clear pauses. In these pauses are where our stories remain. It's where they thrive. Our stories hang in the air long after we've dropped the mic, long after we've left the stage, long after our physical lives have left this earth. Today it is my hope that you will celebrate the power of your utterances. Today is my hope that you will own your stories everywhere in every significant dialogue of your being. Owning your voice is a valuable tool as you think about from which you are entering as you move into new spaces, those new territories that you are charting, those new ter territories for our newly literate, powerful, voices. I remember hearing Ursula Burns, who became a history maker when she became the first black woman to become CEO in 2009 of the Fortune 500, Fortune 500 company Xerox. In a speech once, and I quote, she said, I didn't learn to be quiet when I had an opinion. The reason they knew who I was was because I told them. End of quote. Or to break it down even further, in the words of Lauren Hill, I consider myself a crayon. I might not be your favorite color, but one day you're going to need me to complete your picture. I encourage all of us to be that fierce crayon and tell them who you are each and every day and never accept anyone's puny narratives about who we are in all of our fierce collective truth. As advocates for literacy and activists working hard to ensure the highest quality of life for all of us, we must ensure that our audiences, our constituents, our newly literate citizens, such as Olga, who's my new shero, <laughs> wow, Miss Olga, this is for you. We must empower these people to move forth and move through with new stories in safer places that we are willing, available, and prepared to help our neighbors secure. It's their door now. It might be my door next week. It might be your door too. The world is waiting for our collective knowledge, for our sensibility, 
our integrity, our confidence, our leadership, our purpose, and of course our generosity of spirit, our compassionate listening versus our active listening, our compassionate listening, and our intentional kindnesses. May your story strengthen and nurture all that you are preparing for and all that you are becoming and your steadfast determination to change our world for generations and generations, for our ancestors and for the ones unborn. We are the ones we've been waiting for. I thank you. Peace and blessings upon all. Yeah.